All right, here are the hints for the take-home test um, for the geometry review with history. So starting us off with the first question, it says, in 3200 BC, the invention of writing occurred in Mesopotamia. Um, the circle questions are very important to be good at on the exam. They, New York State loves to put them on. You get the center from these two numbers here. And remember, it's not simply just taking the numbers and writing them. You have to do something with the numbers. And this number at the end of the equation um, can give you your radius. Again, you don't just take the number. You have to change it somehow. For question number two, in 3400 B.C., it says that numbers were invented. And um, for this question here, again, same thing with a circle. Um, these two areas here will help you figure out what your center has to be. And then you're going to have to do something with the 13 to determine the radius. For question 3, this one's setting up to be a question with the Pythagorean theorem. Um, it says it's 45 degrees here, so that must mean that this is 45 degrees as well. And that gives you a triangle that's an isosceles triangle with two angles the same, the base angle's the same. So this will tell you that this side here is also 8, and you're looking for how long the base of this isosceles triangle is, and the little a squared plus b squared equals c squared will get you going on the right direction. And at the end, it looks like the choices are written in simplest radical form, and you're going to have to match up your answer to one of those answers. Use a calculator to help you out with the last step if you want to check your answers. Okay, moving on to question 4, 1000 BC. We got uh, the rise of Hinduism. Let's take a look. This is um, a question involving the finding the center of a circle. And this one can be done pretty easily by using the grid that's at the very bottom of the page. Um, you could also find the midpoint, the midpoint of both the midpoint connecting these two um, points together. So remember the midpoint formula is you take the average of the x's and you take the average of the y's. I would probably just use that formula versus using the picture, but use both to be on the safe side to make sure you find it correctly. For question number five, again, it's finding the slope, and again, you could use the graph below to actually figure out the slope or you could use the slope formula. The slope is the change in y's over the change in the x's. For question 6, for 570 BC, Pythagoras makes mathematical contributions um, and it's not surprising that I made this question one that you could use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out the answer to. So maybe the safest way to lay this one out is to make a right triangle out of the picture with negative 7, 2 and 1, 8. And then use the Pythagorean theorem to find out how long that diagonal distance is. So you'd count this up as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. It's a 6 by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 6 by 8. So with that, you could use the Pythagorean theorem to find the missing side. Or you could use that Pythagorean trick to get you there faster. Or the distance formula, if you know the distance formula. For question 7, 561 BC, Buddha is born. Um, this one is a system of two equations. You're going to have the first equation being a parabola, and the second equation being the line x equals 4. And they want to know how many places does the parabola and the line intersect in. And I'll let you figure that one on your own. This would be the parabola. The line x equals 4 is a vertical line and 
I'll let you consider those questions in terms of how many places they would intersect. If I gave you a hint, it would give away the answer. Question eight, um, is the triangle um, relationship between the angles and the sides? For a question like this, your best bet is to draw a picture of triangle ABC. Try to make it actually match the uh, description that they're giving you, too. So you want to make the angles look like they're 95 degrees and 50 and 35. So with my picture right here, I'm making this angle here a little bit larger than 90 degrees. So that would be my angle A. I want B to be my middle angle, my middle-sized angle of 50 degrees. And make C the little twerpy angle, 35 degrees. So I know that C is the smallest angle, so that means that the side opposite it must be the smallest side. So remember how that works. The smallest side and the smallest angle are always across from each other, and the same goes for the largest angle and the largest side. So that's what you have to do in a question like that. Question. So for question number nine, you're... Um, Looking at two lines that are parallel, cut by a transversal. Trace over those angles, B, E, F. Mark up your picture. B, E, F is this angle right here. So put a little indication right there that that's the angle. D, F, L. D, F, L is this angle here, D, F, L. And then ask yourself, do those angles look the same, different? What's the deal between those angles? Um, those are called corresponding angles. And it's true that corresponding angles are congruent. So set those two equal to each other to find out what x is. And then remember at the very end, you're going to have to plug back in to find the me measurement of angle CFL. CFL is this guy over here. So suppose you got 80 degrees for DFL. If, if you got 80, then this would be 100, but those might be the right answers. Or they might be completely off, but that's what you'd have to do to get your final answer. Again, are these the right answers? I don't know. I'm just showing you what you would do at the end of the question. Okay, for question 10, we're still in the BCs. 214 BC, the Great Wall of China, is beginning to take shape. And for this picture here, um, this involves similar triangles. And we're going to have to take a close look at this one here. We got two triangles here. We got the small triangle, and then we got the entire triangle, the large triangle there. And whenever you have similar triangles, um, you're looking at a situation that involves setting up a proportion. So 12 is to 8 is how it begins. And if you take a look at what I've got so far, I've got the left side divided by the base should match up with the entire left side and the entire base. So that'll give you a head start on what you have to write to solve that one. For question 11 involving the proportions again, just like question above with similar triangles. Um, good idea is to write down the information they're telling us, that that's 6, that this is 4, and you're looking for AD. And again, you're, you're just going to set up a simple proportion to, to begin the question. So you do X over 6, and then it's up to you to figure out what the remaining part is. This is a very popular question that shows up on the test and very easy to score well on it if you set up the proportion correctly. And if you don't, you'd find out that you made a mistake because the answer wouldn't look right. So for example, if you did x over 6 and you made a mistake and you wrote, let's say the second half, you wrote 4 over 6, it's a possibility. If you solve that, if you solve that equation, you'd end up getting that x equals 4. And if you look at the picture, does that even look like 4? Well, if this was 4, how can that be 4? So 
you can see that that's one way to check your answers on these questions is to see if the answer makes sense in the picture. Uh, question 12 is again picking up on something involving the triangle any or the triangle relationship between the longest side and the longest angle. Um, drawing the picture is maybe the toughest thing to do for this question and um, start off by making an isosceles triangle. Write down your base and your vertex and then determine what they're, they're telling you. They're telling you that CA and CB are the same. So CA and CB are the same. It must mean that the vertex is C and CA is the same as CB. So that's the picture they want you to draw to begin with. It says if side CA is extended through A to F, if side CA is extended through A to F, what's the longest side of triangle FAB? Hmm. So another triangle is being formed. And they're asking, what is the longest side of that triangle? All right, so let's see how much of more of a hint do I want to give you. It's hard for me to say exactly how much more to give. Um, Well, we'll let you muddle that one over. Yeah, I th thought, the second thought here for this question 12, it's, that's a tough question. And um, what makes the question tough is there's no numbers here. But um, if you're f using the hints, might as well give away most of the answer here. Um, if you're dealing with an isosceles triangle, the base angles have to be acute. So the base angles have to be less than 90 degrees. If the base angles are less than 90 degrees, then this angle here has to be an obtuse angle. And the triangle can't have more than one obtuse angle, so the obtuse angle has to be the largest angle, and that should help you figure out the longest side. So um, I don't mind giving away the answer almost, but um, that was definitely a complicated one to get right and to actually have a reason why it's right to actually know it. And now I'm going on to question 13. It's talking about a dilation. A dilation between two uh, points. And dilation means you're multiplying. So the thing you want to figure out here is the constant of dilation. Um, each point is three times larger than the other in terms of the numbers. So you're going to use you're going to apply that idea to this question here. For question 14, it says that Muhammad was born in Mecca. For so for a question like 14, um, drawing a picture is an important way to go. And this is one of my can't miss questions on the exam. I'm pretty sure a question like this will show up and it's pretty easy to do if you know the small little trick involved in setting this thing up. So there's three sides to this triangle and they've given you the measurements of those three sides and you're connecting the midpoints together. When you connect midpoints of a triangle you end up getting a triangle that's half as big. Okay, uh, question 15. It says Charlemagne is crowned. Let's take a look what it says there. Okay, those are vertical angles. And this should be pretty basic. These two angles are different or the same? They're the same. So you say that they're equal to each other. Don't let the parentheses throw you off either. Um, in fact, the parentheses aren't even needed in this question. And then just take it from there. Good news here, and this one, is that all they want is the value of x. So once you find out what x is, you are done. 
All right, so this one here is question 16. It's split up on two slides here for me. Um, it says that there are two segments that are perpendicular, and it says that the slope of JK is 3 over 4. And they want to know the slope of PQ. Well, it's a pretty, pretty quick one to get right. If JK is a slope of 3 fourths, that means for every 1, 2, 3 up, you slide over 1, 2, 3, 4. So this would be an example of something that has a slope of up 3 over 4. Now if you want perpendicular to it, it has to be going in the opposite direction. So right off the very bat, we know the slope has to be negative. And the rest is for you to figure out. You should know about negative reciprocals. So the answer is negative something over something. Okay, question 17. 1066, the Battle of Hastings. Um, one of the th few things they do remember about social studies. Uh, for question 17, two consecutive angles of a parallelogram are given. Well, it all comes down to knowing your vocabulary for the consecutive angles of a parallelogram. Those are the angles that are side by side or up and down from each other. So they're those two angles, for example, would be consecutive inside this parallelogram. And since I've got the picture drawn, these are consecutive angles, A and B. Ask yourself by looking at the picture, are they the same size or different size? To me, this one looks to be obtuse, and this one here looks to be acute. So it would be wrong to say that they are equal to each other, so don't write that. You need one other fact, the fact about consecutive angles being supplementary. For question 18, reflection over the origin or through the origin. Remember that a reflection through the origin is identical to a rotation of 180 degrees. And there's a simple rule for figuring that, um, the, the answer. Another way to get the question right is to graph it and then turn your paper upside down because a reflection through the origin is identical to rotating the picture 180 degrees. So 3, 4, 5, 6, negative 6, comma 5 is right over here in quadrant 2. And then when we reflect it through the origin, it's identical to rotating it up or rotating it by 180 degrees. So just name the point that you see there and you got it. Question 19. Okay, 19 is um, an essential one that you have to know. The three angles of a triangle have to add up to 180 degrees. Again, don't let the parentheses throw you off. They don't even they aren't even really needed in the question. So some students actually see those parentheses and they're not sure what to do with them. So instead, just make them all equal to 180, add up to 180 degrees, find out what y equals, plug it back in, and then determine what kind of triangle it is based on the angle measurements that you get. Okay, for question 20, equation of the line that's perpendicular, perpendicular to this. So we've got y equals negative, oops, we do have y minus 2x equals 4. And I want to find out what the slope of that is, so I'm going to add 2x to both sides to get the y by itself. So I get y equals 2x plus 4. So the slope that I've got is equal to 2. The slope that I need is equal to the negative reciprocal of 2. Negative reciprocal of 2 is the same as saying, thing as saying the negative reciprocal of 2 over 1. 
which would be negative one-half, and that's how to start the question. We know the slope has to have, has to be negative a half, so, well, I guess lucky for us, we don't even have to find the y value, the y-intercept, because there's only one possibility here that has a slope that's negative one-half. Uh, question 21. For question 21, remember there's a, a quick trick there to figure out what the third side has to be. If you're given two sides and they want to know what's possible for the third side, you take the two sides and subtract them. Take the two sides and add them together. And that's telling you that the third side has to be in between these two measurements, 3 and 7. So there's only one answer that would work out there that's in between both. And that's a nice quick trick to really get that question right. Okay, moving ahead on question 22, saying um, which of these following shapes has has a um, have diagonals that will create four congruent triangles. I think your best bet there is to just draw the four shapes. Draw a picture of something that looks like a rhombus to the best of your ability. Draw something that's a rectangle. Should be easy enough. A trapezoid, any old trapezoid. And then draw an isosceles trapezoid. And then draw the diagonals in. Does this, does this um, configuration create four triangles that are all congruent to each other? No. So it's not an isosceles trapezoid. So draw in your diagonals and you can see the answer that way. For question 23, they're asking you, looks like a very complicated question, they're asking you to reflect an image of a segment over or an entire triangle over the line y equals x. Now you don't have to draw any type of reflection because there's not any information given about the location of the triangle. Um, on this one here, it's picking on the fact that when you reflect, when you reflect something, when you flip it, it does not change its size. So in question 23, when they're telling you that AB is this, and its reflection is this length, those lengths would have to be the same length, because if, if you have a segment and you reflect it over the line y equals x, it doesn't matter how large the segment is. When you reflect it, its reflection is also going to be the same length. So in this question here, 2x plus 13 would have to equal 9x minus 8. So that's a clever question that New York State wrote. Question 24. Looks like the question is busted up between two different slides. So as shown in the diagram below, we got diagonals that intersect at E. I'm going to have to redraw that on the next page, probably. So, yeah, let's explain everything is pretty good, but when I, when I get my worksheets transferred over, sometimes it does not play nice. So that's what it looks like, sort of. <laughs> so there's your rectangle, and it says that AE is worth x plus 2. Notice I'm drawing on the paper. BD is the entire length, and that's 4x minus 16 for this whole length right here. This is something I've been talking about in class. Does it make sense to say that x plus 2 is equal to 4x minus 6? Let's take a look at the picture. Is x plus 2 equal all of this? No. So don't be in such a hurry of setting up a question the wrong way and 
con continue to solve it and get it wrong. Instead, play it smart. So x plus 2 does not equal 4x minus 16. There's a few ways to set up this question correctly. Probably the easiest way is to realize that x plus 2 is half as long as all of this. So x plus 2 is half as long as that large piece. And you know, you can continue to think about it that way. You could also, instead of setting up an equation, you could also just try each of these choices out and see which answers when you plug them, which of these when you plug in, will actually make the picture look right. For example, if x is 6, I get 6 plus 2, which is 8. If x is 6, I get 4 times 6, which is 24. 24 take away 16 is 8. So if I tried 6, it means that this is 8 and this is 8. And that is ridiculous, so it can't be choice 1. So there's a few ways to work out question 24. For question 25, to write the equation of a circle, you should know that your target should be to write something that resembles resembles this. And knowing your circles is very important. It'll be on the exam. So that's how that one starts off. Question 26 is showing a reflection. And that's one that I won't even help you with. I just told you it's a reflection by the way that it's flipped. Let's see. Question 27 they want you to discover whether these two equations are parallel, perpendicular, or neither. And your best bet there is to take each equation and get y alone. Then you can compare the slopes. So treat it as two separate questions, get the y alone for each, and then take a good look at the number in front of the x, the coefficient in front of x will tell you if, this, if they are parallel, perpendicular, or neither. Hey, okay, question 28. In question 28, they're telling us that AC is congruent to BD. So if those two red stripes are the same, could you say that BC has to be the same length as AB? Is it guaranteed that that would have to be true? So for, so, for example, if this was 100 and this was 100, does that mean that this has to be 50 and this has to be 50? I don't think so. Think about the subtraction postulate for question 28. For question 29, a good way to begin thinking about that question is just to think, of, think about the basic the basics of a median of a trapezoid. If this was 40 and this was 20 for the two bases of a trapezoid, then the median would have to be 30 because the two bases added together and then divided by 2 would have to equal the length of the median. Or in other words, the average of 20 and 40 would have to be the middle length, which would have to be 30. So in this picture here, to get it right, definitely mark up the picture. These are the pieces that they're giving you. So I'm drawing right on my picture. And use that same sort of idea together. That 5x minus 9 plus who? plus the other base, x plus 3, divided by 2, has to equal the median, which is 2x plus 2. You could cross multiply to get it started, and you finish. All right, question 30. 
you're talking about reflecting over the line y equals x. And these are all important words to, to know. Parallelism means lines that start parallel end up parallel. Perpendicular, perpendicularity yeah, means that two lines that start off perpendicular end up perpendicular. Orientation means that they are the shape or the object is pointed in the same direction as before. Congruence means that the two shapes are the are the, are congruent to each other, the same side. So, um, when you reflect over the line y equals x, when you do a reflection, one of these four is not preserved. We just saw earlier today that congruence is preserved. We're looking for the one that's not preserved. Question 31 is involving a centroid of a triangle and there's a relationship there with the pieces that are involved. Remember that this piece here is always half as big as this piece here. And it works like that for every segment inside that triangle that this mark here, PE, is half as big as AP. And it looks to be true, even from this picture. And the last little bit, DP, is half as big as PC. Question 32 is asking you to give a missing piece here. Once we know that the triangles are congruent, then in this picture we know that the triangles are congruent. And if the triangles are congruent, then the parts would have to be congruent. So you should know what goes there. We've done it a couple dozen times this year. For question 33, the picture that they're showing there is, is gotten by someone using a compass to draw an arc this way and then putting the pointy end here and striking out another arc this way moving the point here and striking another point here whenever that's done you are creating an angle bisector where these two angles here have to be identical to each other I mean there are some facts here that you can get right without even doing any work like for example are these two triangles similar to each other do they have the same shape? Well, no. I mean, these two triangles here, the one at the top and the bottom, are certainly not the same shape. Do you see a right angle in the picture anywhere? There's nothing that says anything about 90 degree angles. You didn't create a perpendicular bisector. So nothing looks like a sharp edge, like a corner. So it's probably not that one. Question 34. 1969, we made it to the moon. Some people don't believe we did, but we did. Uh, this one's talking about similar triangles. And if two triangles are similar, I don't even need to look at a picture. Maybe it says that there's a diagram below. But if the two triangles are similar, then the angles that are in this similarity statement have to be identical to each other. And you can get that right by looking at this picture here. Even these two, even though these two angles are coming from two different triangles, the triangles are similar to each other. So these two triangles have matching angles all the way through. Angle B is the same as angle F. They are different side lengths, but the opening is the same amount of degrees. And the same thing applies here. These two angles are the same. So that's your equation that you have to write. It says find the value of x, find it, and you're done. Question 35 is asking you to graph a circle and a line that goes through it and find out where they intersect. It says you can solve it either algebraically or graphically. Well, in, in this course, Graphically is usually the best way to, to handle them. I, I haven't seen any algebraic ones on the exam at all. Um, it could be done with the substitution method if you wanted to, but the easiest way to do it is to graph that circle, 
that has a center at 0, 0, and a radius of 5. And then you graph this line. Before you graph a line, it's a good idea to get the line in good shape by getting y by itself. You get y equals x plus 1, and then you can graph that as well. So graph the circle, graph the line, find out where they cross. It says to check your answer at the end. You can check your answer by plugging them back in. All right, for question 36, they are asking us to do a series of things. First of all, to graph these two points and connect them together and label it. So label the segment ME. Second thing they want us to do is to shift ME to create a brand new point S and a brand new point E. So they want us to take the points for M and E and shift it two spaces to the right and six spaces down. After that, after you do all that work, they're asking us to prove or they want us to find out is METS, the four points that are now on your paper, would that form a parallelogram? To prove it's a parallelogram or to prove that it's not a parallelogram, you'd have to take a look at the slope of all four sides. If the opposite sides have equal slopes, then you've got yourself a parallelogram. So if opposite sides have equal slopes, then it's a parallelogram. Okay, question 37 is asking us to prove that two parts, TW and TX, are the same. So in this two-column proof, where we have statements and reasons, I know that at the end, I'm going to have to prove that two parts are congruent. And the way we prove that two parts of triangles are congruent is by CPCTC. So I know how the question is going to finish. Before I even look at anything else, I know that that's going to happen. I don't know how many steps it's going to take. I know that I can't use CPCTC until I get that the triangles are congruent. So above there, I'm going to get, going to have to prove that two triangles are congruent beforehand, before I actually use CPCTC. So I know the last two parts of my proof are going to look like that. Now the reason here could be one of those five congruence, con congruency reasons, and I won't know which one it's going to be yet until I get some more information on my page. But I know it's going to end in one of these five ways. The way the question begins, they're giving me two facts. Those would be my first two steps of the proof. And now I've got the question like a giant sandwich. I've actually got the beginning figured out and I've got the ending figured out. Now I just have to get the filling in between. All right, because it's a rhombus, what do rhombuses have? All four sides the same. And there is one part that I need, that VT is the same as what? As ST. Because a rhombus has four congruent sides. So I've got one side and another side for both triangles. So I've got one pair so far. Another thing that you might see right away are the vertical angles. That could be in step four. So we've got two angles matching up with each other. Now the last fact is a little bit tricky to get. And it comes from this part right here, about in, in line two. They're telling me that RSX is the same as RVW. So those red angles are the same. Now that's nice to know that those two red angles are the same, but I don't need those red angles 
what I need is I need these black angles here. Because I need angles inside my triangle. So I've got too much. What I have to do is I have to remove the excess, the part that I don't need. So I don't need this part or this part here. I need to get rid of those parts. So what I'll begin to do is I'll say that first of all that these two angles are congruent. That'll be in line 5. Why are those two angles congruent? Because it's in a rhombus and opposite opposite angles in a rhombus are congruent. And that can be written right here. If I use subtraction, I can get these red angles here by subtracting away these angles in black from angles that are mentioned at the beginning of the question. So if I start with the yellow angles, that's given in step two, and I subtract away the black angles in step five, I'll get that those red angles are congruent in step six. So angle WVT is congruent to angle XST. And that would be with subtraction. All right, so without giving the entire answer away, that's the type of thinking that's involved there. Hopefully you listened to all this and got something out of it. I'm sure that you are on your way to scoring much better because you're taking the time to do this. So good luck and keep on plugging away and doing your best. Every day do your best.